Genesis 32 verses chapter verses 22 to 32. Jacob wrestles with God. That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two maidservants and, and 11 sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent all of his possessions. So Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to, the, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, it's very bizarre here in the church at the moment because uh, although you can hear me and I can see you, I can't actually hear anything. So I'm just going to go on the assumption that, Chris, you read that really well. Um, and uh, thank you for doing that and for everyone who's taken part this morning. Uh, we're taking a break in our uh, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality series. Um, and as often we do on Remembrance Sunday, we pick up a theme uh, that is sort of fits in with what's going on around the country. And uh, uh, today we are picking up on this great story with Jacob. And I was reminded of a, a quote as I was preparing that said, stories were written in the Bible, not that so that we could learn to live a good life, but so that we could live a new life. And this is why the Bible is so full of characters who aren't actually people who are super virtuous or, or uh, of such high moral standards. They are uh, heroes who are corrupt, corruptible people, people who have made mistakes, who have gone it wrong, but yet in the whole grand scheme of God's faithfulness, he, he takes that brokenness and the messiness of life and he makes it new. And Jacob here in our, our, our passage is no different. His whole life is broken. It's full of lies, family breakup. And yet through this fight with God that he has, this encounter, this wrestling with God, he walks away a completely new and transformed person. We too, I believe, long for that encounter. To have such a deep and profound encounter with God that all that messiness, all that brokenness is taken up and we are put in that new place and that new trajectory. And in this account, what I want us to draw from is how is it that we can encounter God in a really powerful way? How is it that we can encounter God so that our lives deeply change? And I believe that's through two things in this passage that we can do it. The first one, which is evident, is through our weakness. You know, Jacob, at this point in his life, had been wandering around. He'd, be, he'd escaped from the family because his, he took the family birthright uh, that didn't belong to him. It should have been his older brother. And so he wanders around and he works for his uh, uh, Laban and he marries a girl. And eventually God has this, gives him this dream and tells him and says, listen, you need to go back home. And so he's going back home, but he knows that his brother Esau has sworn to kill him. And so he sends messengers ahead and the servants come back to him and they say, listen, Esau's coming with 400 men. And so what Jacob does, he takes all his belongings, he takes his family and he puts them into two groups and says, well, if he attacks one, then I know the other's going to be okay. And, and he sends them all ahead of him. 
and the family crossed the, the little river and Jacob is on his own. He withdraws and he's just left alone as Esau gets closer. And here at this point in our story, you know, Jacob is alone at God's request. He's fearing at God's request for his life, but in still he's being obedient in going forward. And surely at this moment when we read the story, we say, well, if, if Jacob is being obedient to what God is saying to him, surely there should be a, a sense of peace that falls upon his heart so he can walk through the furnace and the trial ahead. You know, surely God should undertake his emotions so that he's mentally strong and not fearing and he could just press on. But what happens in this story is that Jacob is forced into a wrestling match and he ends up limping for the rest of his life. And we might sit there and say, well, where's the God of love in this? Where is it? Where's the God who blesses you if you're obedient? Where is the God who meets you if you're walking in his, his obedience? And you know, sometimes our image and our projection of God doesn't always fit who God really is. This is the God that meets us, that contradicts our thinking, that says, this is who I am. You know, God does love us immeasurably. The view of the cross is a God who comes to us and meets us in our weakness. He's the one who sits there and says, listen, you don't deserve, you can't do this, but I'll do it for you. He's the God who meets us in our suffering and who takes all the things that are bad and transforms them for our good and his glory. But here in this reading, in this moment, God wrestles Jacob into the transformed life. He, he grabs hold of him and they wrestle together. And it's quite an intimate sort of thing, isn't it? To wrestle together. And I think often in our spiritual lives, we want God to work with us gently, patiently, steadily. And the Holy Spirit does do that. We know in Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3, there is that gentle work and movement of the Holy Spirit. But you know, there's also times in our spiritual lives where God physically almost has to get hold of us and bring us to this place where we wrestle and, and we wrestle for growth and he wrestles that change into us. And here in this passage, Jacob wrestles, but he doesn't actually have a clear idea it's God at the beginning who he's wrestling with until we get to verse 28. And he realizes and he knows and he, 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 he calls the place Penuel, which effectively means coming face to face with God. But what, Jake, what is it that in this story wakens Jacob's awareness that he's wrestling with God himself, where he comes to that realization that he's not just wrestling anyone? Well, along with most scholars, I think it's at verse 25. Although he would have known the stories of his grandfather, of Abraham, of God turning up as a visitor and, and those sort of uh, situations of God being present at different moments, the, the time when he has this great sort of awakening and this realization that he's wrestling not just with anyone is that moment where his hip is touched. You know, in the Hebrew, when uh, it says that his hip is touched, it's not a great big whack. It's not a punch to the hip that suddenly renders him limping. In the Hebrew, it says it's a light tap. And that that moment where he is just tapped on the hip and crippled, the dialogue begins, let me go. And Jacob says, no, I will not let you go until you bless me. And when we step back from the story, what we see is that in Jacob's struggle, in that moment of weakness, as he's crippled, as he's hurt, as he's, as he's sitting there in the, in, in the fight, when he's most vulnerable, at that moment, he refuses to let go of God. He refuses to let go of God in that moment of weakness. He clings on. You know, we live in an age of instant gratification. You know, I was, I was sort of laughing as I was reflecting on this because uh, Caroline and I went for a walk on, on Friday around Arlington Reservoir. Uh, and as we were driving back, you know, you're hungry after a walk, aren't you? If you've had a good stretch of the legs. But as you come up to the Polegate uh, roundabout, there's a big McDonald's, isn't there? And I'm sort of whispering in Caroline's ear, oh, wouldn't it be just great to get a double cheeseburger? You know, fulfill that instant need because we've got a fast food restaurant. 
But it doesn't stop there. We can always fulfill our needs, can't we, with the things around us. If you go on Amazon, you can have something delivered the next day. If you want entertainment, it's there at a click of a button on your TV or on your iPad. And yet, our world has changed around us. As much as we can be instantly gratified by some things, we're now facing a second lockdown where actually there are some things that we cannot have, no matter how much we want them. There is no so social gathering. There is no family uh, sense of coming together for family events. The church family has been stopped from meeting again. And so in this moment of vulnerability and weakness, in this moment where our desires cannot be met in the way that we want them, what is our response to the pain? What is our response to the frustration? Maybe this time over the month, it's an opportunity for God to wrestle out those needs and those wants of sinful desires, those sense of, of just satisfying of what I want. And now is the time we sit there and say, Lord, I'm holding on to you because I want you to bless me. I'm praying into you. I'm praying into this situation until you bless. But it's an interesting thing, isn't it, to pray for a blessing? So often in Jacob's life, and I believe in ours too, we reduce the idea of God's blessing down to the things that I think this is what God should bless in order that I should gain. You know, we can even disguise good lists of what God should bless, but not always are they the ones that are on God's list. You know, in this moment of personal encounter, Jacob, for the first time in his life, and I think quite poignantly in this passage, he isn't wrestling with something in order to get a blessing that he might gain. You see, when you look at Jacob's life, in the womb he wrestled to get first over his twin brother. Came out and holding on the heel, wanting to be first, fighting in the womb with him. He wanted the family blessing, the sense of favor upon his life. And so he tricked his dad, stole from his brother what was rightfully his in order to get the blessing he wanted. When his father uh, Laban tricks him because he wants the blessing of a, of a, a beautiful wife. He wants the blessing of the wealth of livestock, so he tricks his father. He wants the blessing of marrying Rachel, the woman of who he loves. All his life has been marked by saying, this is what I want. This is what I want you to bless. But now in this moment, as he's wrestling with God, as he's there in his moment of weakness, in amongst this crisis moment with Esau, as he's wrestling with him, and instead of asking for a blessing and saying, I want dominance over my brother, I want favor, I want to live, he doesn't ask for anything but a blessing. And that's because in this moment of encounter, he has realized that God is enough in this fight. He stops looking for favor in the family. He stops looking for status through the wealth in order to accumulate what he has. He stops looking for love in a person in order to feel blessed. He just wants the blessing of God. He just wants God to bless him and bring his own, God's own approval, God's own supply, God's own love upon him. When we see in our relationship with God, That he is more than just the person who I want to bless the things and needs and wants in my life. When we grasp him and say he is the thing above all other else. When we sit there and say he is, he is the first in my life. When we sit there and make him the only thing that is the object and desire of our hearts. And this is where the blessing flows in our lives. This is where we learn and mature in our spiritual life. As we grow more and more into that, the blessings of God truly flow. And it's the same thing that Jesus said. Jesus in his ministry constantly made it an all or nothing approach that make me the object, make me the one and the blessings will come. Doesn't he? He says, come to me all who are weary. He doesn't say sort of just treat me as a sideshow. Come to me, give yourself to me and I will give you rest. He sits there in the Sermon on the Mount and says, no one can serve two masters. You will always prioritize one over the other. And then famously, he says, whoever wants to be my disciple, my follower, whoever wants to come after me and inherit these things in the kingdom of God and my relationship must what? Deny themselves, take up their cross 
and follow me. Deny everything. Is God this morning the main thing in your life? Or is he a friend you call upon when you want something? If you want to have a deep personal encounter with the Lord, then make God the very person, the very thing that you cling on to and you grab hold on and you don't let go and you say, until you bless me. There's something else in this passage we need to learn as well. That as much as we talk about meeting God in our own weakness, we need to encounter God through his weakness. This is something that someone else uh, pulled up in my studies, and it's a great point, and I want to pull this out. If you look at verse 25 again, it says that when the man saw that he could not overpower him, that's Jacob, he touched Jacob's hip. Now, let's step back for a second and just think about that. God is wrestling with Jacob, Jacob with, with God. And then this moment, God sits there and, and it says he could not overpower him. And you're thinking, well, well what, how can that be? God who flung stars into space, God who is the, the all-powerful one, sits there and says he could not overpower him. And you're thinking, wow, what's going on in, in, in this text? What's happening? This is the God who says, you cannot see me in the daylight. You cannot see my face, otherwise you'll die, effectively. So what's happening here? Well, God leads Jacob to a place where the Lord is willing to lose in order that Jacob could win. You see, if God had won in that moment, if God had just floored Jacob and put him down, he could have possibly ended up dead. He would have been devastated, but yet God gives him the sense of victory. But as, a, as it does in the encounter, it leads him to a place of a transformed life where he ends up with a new name. He's no longer called the deceiver, but he's called Israel. He's no longer uh, walking in the shadow of the past, but walking to a new hope of the future. You see, verses 30 and 31 are all about the vision of grace that Jacob realizes he suddenly comes to this sense that, wow, I have just met face to face with God and I have lived. I have lived in this moment. And then it, I think poetically in this passage, he walks into a new horizon. He walks into a new morning. But yet if we know our Bibles, this is not the first time that God gives up his strength so that someone else could win that someone else could be transformed, that someone else could receive a new name and walk into a new hope. Jesus on the cross held nothing back, did not withstand nothing. He bears in this moment on the cross the full weight of divine judgment of all humanity. All of God's justice is poured about poured out upon him and the cross in that moment. He bears the weight of every sin, of every wrong thing that we have done and said. He takes upon himself the rejection, the shame of everyone around him, of all us as two. And he wrestles each one to the point that he dies. He loses in that moment so that we could win. He dies in our place. He takes our punishment and bears our sin and shame. Why? So that we could be, have people who could be walking in a new name. We are called the sons and daughters of God. We are not masked with the shame and the sin and the guilt. We, we, we walk with a new identity, just like Jacob. We learn to walk in the truth, and we know that the truth can set us free of what he has done. We know we walk in the sense of affection that God loves us, that he gave himself for us. But we also walk into that newness of hope because of the resurrection. Just as Jacob walks into the new light and the new dawn of the new morning, it reminds me of the Emmaus Road experience. Walking in a new week, walking with the risen Christ, walking with a new humanity as a husband and wife are walking and talking with Jesus at that moment. Everything is new. Everything is blessed. 
You see, to encounter God isn't just in our weakness to grab hold of him, but to encounter God, to have a deep personal spiritual encounter in the wrestle is to grab hold of him in his weakness and not be moved either. There is always a danger that we know the gospel, we believe it, but we don't live in it. You see, we can look at the times of of our lives and we can perhaps reflect and just see, just like Jacob, we've been selfish. We've been looking and asking God to bless things for our own need and not for the others, not for anything else of what God desires. We can admit that we've been distant in, in our relationship with God. We've not put him first like we want to. And you see, our normal human experience is that when we've done wrong, we recoil, we come back. We shy away. You know, I see it with my kids. If I tell them off, like my youngest one, she she sort of cowers up. You know, you see the body. It sort of almost wants to self-protect because of the shame, because of the the wrongness. And it, it, it almost creates a bit of a distance. And we still do the same as adults. We still do the same thing internally. But if we see that God's love for us in Jesus is that he became weak so that we could become strong. He gave up so that we could inherit. When we see that and we grab hold of that, what it does is rather than pushes away, it magnetizes us to the cross. It magnetizes us to the love of God. It compels us to come forward and encounter him again and again and again, because we can. We spoke about two things this morning about having a deep personal encounter with God, just as Jacob does here. And to do that, we know we've been talking about that you hold on to God in our moment of weakness, that we don't let go, but also that we know that in order to encounter God, that through his weakness, we don't let go of the cross, we don't let go of of what has been given to us. And we stamp it firmly on our hearts. You know, we live in crazy times. We live in very strange times. It's very easy just to let go, to drift, to, to just uh, try and batten down the hatches and get on with it. But yet, if we look at this story, if we look at these times, it's calling us to hold it, to dig in and to hold on, to hold on and say, God bless me in these moments. I pray that you may know the deep blessing of God through this time of lockdown, through this time of being together. Let's pray for that this morning. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for the way that you deal with us. We thank you, Lord, that you know us more than we know ourselves. And we want to acknowledge again, Father, your leading and your guiding. Lord, we want to reaffirm that sense of holding on to you in all circumstances, in all things. Forgive us when we let go or wander off like a child. May we hear that call of the Father, beckoning us to come back and to walk faithfully with you, to know that deep assurance of faith and love. May you instill in us again, Father, that wonder of belonging, that desire to be deeply changed by you through that. In Jesus' name, amen.